My face is red with weeping and deep darkness is on my eyelids. So begins Job's words in Job chapter 16 verse 16. As Job's losses and sorrows engulfed him, his life was changed forever. His reputation, his family and his livelihood, his health and his friendships all lay in tatters around him. His financial security dawned, his assumptions shattered and his self-righteousness exposed. Job is forced to explore some of the ultimate questions of faith. How do we make sense of life amidst profound sorrow and suffering? Will there ever be an end to the sorrows that he is facing and the pains of life? And where is God in the midst of all of it? He comes to regard his own life with deep contempt and resentment and he cries out to God in words that send a shudder down the spine. Withdraw your hand from me. Job is tormented and he is stretched by death and by loss. He cries out, if mortal die, mortals die, will they live again? Here's a man who is deeply acquainted with grief and with sorrow and with uncertainty. His story has something to say to all of us as we walk through the shadow lands of the COVID-19 pandemic. And as Pentecostals, as pastors, as leaders, as men and women that are committed to the life of the local church, we must take this opportunity to stop and think about what we believe and how we can minister into a world that is broken and fractured by the sorrow and pain that COVID-19 has exposed. Job has been forced into the crucible of pain and his words echo down through the centuries, rebounding in the chambers of our own hearts at a time when sorrow and loss seems to be engulfing the world. Grief, loss, death, so often kept at bay by our sanitised language and our cultural concealers, have come banging on the doors of homes around the world, your homes and my homes on our ministerial fraternity and fellowship of women and men. Death has knocked on our door, in our churches, in our leadership teams, in our theology as a community, as a movement. Death, grief and sorrow are knocking on the door. Watching the news has become a ritual of astonishment for many of us and heartbreak. Across the world, the numbers of deaths rise exponentially on a daily basis. We're thankfully coming out of the curve in the United Kingdom, but the number of deaths, 26,000, 30,000, 32,000, who knows, as we continue to work out what these figures look like, one thing is for sure, they're much higher than they sit at present. Will there be another spike? Will there be another outbreak? How will we cope with it? And what does Pentecostal theology have to say into all of this? What does it say into lives that are broken and fractured by sorrow and by grief. I think we have something to say. And I think as we stop and think about it as a movement and as men and women committed to serving communities and to preaching the gospel, we have some deep and profound and important questions to ask of ourselves and to reflect upon as we think about loss. Take, for example, some of the challenges faced around the world. Mali has an estimated one ventilator per one million people. Kenya has only 550 intensive care beds for a population of more than 50 million. And on a continent like Africa that has faced the pressures of Ebola and tuberculosis and HIV and other infectious diseases, diseases the COVID-19 pandemic could be catastrophic. So what do we as pastors and as Christians say into all of that? The reporting of death can become so overwhelming that we turn it into a news item a story that we read about or a set of statistics that we analyse. There is good reason for that, I think. How can we possibly imagine the suffering and the sorrow that this pandemic is carrying in its wake? But we must remember that behind every single statistic, there is a human face, a human story and a human tragedy. Families aren't just losing numbers, they are losing loved ones. It's happening everywhere and it's happening to everyone. And Christians are not immune to this heartbreak. Whilst many have said that we can just quote scriptures like Psalm 91 over ourselves, 
and that they are somehow a spiritual panacea and a protection. I'm not so sure. Godly people are dying from this virus. We aren't immune from it. We shouldn't pretend that we are. A theology that claims protection but doesn't face reality does more harm than good. It might work for those who feel that they have been spared because of their prayers or because of their faithfulness. But it will leave shards, like shards of sharp glass of despair for many who have lost lost loved ones as a result of this outbreak. I, like you, am praying for grace, for wisdom and for protection for all people, and particularly for those that I love and care about. I'm doing it every night on Facebook and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are joining in that on a daily basis. I've seen well over 100 people come to faith as a result of that simple online ministry at night. But in the midst of it all, I'm aware that there are many who I know and who I love who have already become sick of this virus and some of them have died. Either I'm not praying properly or my approach to the outbreak and how I handle despair and suffering needs to be carefully considered. You see, I think as pastors, we have a responsibility to help people face death, sorrow and uncertainty with hope and confidence, but not with some sense of pretense or triumphalism. It's my job, it's your job, it's our calling to help people walk through sorrow and loss authentically. I don't want to indulge in short-term escapism, nor do I want to declare false promises over people that are not going to help them in the long run. As a pastor, as a public theologian, and as a practical theologian, I'm trying my best to guide my congregation and others through the pain and the uncertainty of this time. We have daily prayer times when thousands join online. I'm writing, thinking, blogging, talking, doing videos like this. I'm calling a number of people every day to check on them. We as a fellowship and as individuals are involved in the community. We're helping our hospitals. We're serving and supporting the vulnerable. We're sharing the hope of God's grace and the promise of God's comfort to all who are sick, who are worried or who are grieving. Over a hundred people a day are contacting me from around the world who have lost loved ones to COVID-19, asking for help, support, spiritual guidance, listening. I've had countless numbers of conversations with people, helping them to process their grief, their sorrow and their loss. What do I say to them? How do I walk with them through the dark and the uncertain season that this has generated? As a father, as a grandfather and as a husband, I'm trying to help and to support my own family too. My wife, Debbie, is a respiratory specialist and lectures in nursing and respiratory care here in Northern Ireland in Queen's University. She also has brittle asthma and is in shielding. Our son has a lung disorder. Our first grandchild was born on the 16th of March. We saw him for a couple of days and feel desperately disconnected from him and from his mum and dad. Our daughter had to make a dash home from university to be with us. Our son-in-law has caught COVID-19. My father-in-law is in a nursing home and my mother-in-law and the family can't see him. My sister lives alone and is facing this crisis with deep periods of mourning, which she can't visit the graves of those that we have lost. What can I do to help them with their sorrow and their grief and with their pain? I think I want to think with you just for a few minutes about different categories of response that we can make to COVID-19 the pastoral response, the personal response, the public response, and think about what they all might look like within a Pentecostal context. And I want to start by suggesting you to you that we need to alter our understanding of death. A theology of death <clears throat> is not a theology of despair. Accepting death, coming to terms with it, working out what we do when we walk through it, is not an admittance of defeat. It's not a surrendering to despair. Human beings hate death because we were not made for death. We were made for life. We struggle with it because it's not part of what we want. We run from it as an ultimate enemy. Too often, our theology of death is one of fear, anxiety and uncertainty. That's probably the root reason that so many Christians particularly charismatics and Pentecostals, 
take a stance of declaring life over themselves and over others. If you are always living in the shadow of death, you will do everything you can to avoid it. When we fail to adequately reflect on death theologically and biblically, we end up taking positions that are broken, at best damaged and at worst destructive. It's only when I can be honest about what I hate about death that I can begin to form a response to it that will carry me or those I'm trying to help through the pain of it. In order to separate feelings of ultimate despair and therefore ultimate fear from my experiences of death, or to help others do the same, I have to work out what a Christian, biblical, hopeful response is to death, to mourning, to grief and to sadness. I have to find a way of facing it honestly, hopefully and helpfully. To face death honestly is to recognise what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 26. The last enemy to be defeated is death. Understanding that for myself and helping others understand it opens a door of honesty, vulnerability and being able to be clear and exposed about my heartbreak, my pain, my confusion and my loss. Job's story teaches me a great deal about that. The deep darkness that was on his eyelids as he walked through sorrow and loss is actually the same phrase that is used in Psalm 23 verse 4 that speaks of God walking with us through the valley of the shadows of death. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Psalm 23, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Tzal mavet is the Hebrew phrase, incredibly difficult to translate. And yet, In Psalm 23 verse 4, this deep dark valley of the shadow of death is the same deep darkness that rests on Job's eyelids in Job chapter 16 verse 16. A shadow in a valley of despair, of sorrow, of loss, of uncertainty. Death does feel like darkness descending. It does bring uncertainty, pain and the questioning of faith with it. If I fail to acknowledge those realities, then I'm locking myself or others into a world where sorrow, pain, heartbreak and loss are only negative things. Darkness is used as an image of sorrow in many places in our cultural landscape and in Christian imagery. To enter the darkness biblically though is also to enter a place where God can be encountered. I wrote a book recently called Good Grief and I had no idea that it was going to be as prophetic and as timely as it is now, and I speak about darkness in it and the challenge of living in the darkness of sorrow and uncertainty and pain. Here's something that I said. So much of my life has been lived in the shadows of so many different kinds. Death has been a shadow. Despair has been a shadow. Disappointment has been a shadow. Tragedy has been a shadow. Hurt has been a shadow. Uncertainty has been a shadow. Failure has been a shadow. I can no more avoid the darkness of death than I can the light of life. Darkness as a metaphor for death, shadows as a metaphor for sorrow, and mists as a metaphor for mourning, all open ways of me being honest about death. And these metaphors are used in the scriptures in positive ways too. God is encountered in the darkness. Shadows prove the presence of light. The mists of uncertainty or questioning can lead to new discoveries of faith and hope. Job teaches us that. Being honest about the darkness and uncertainty of death helps us to avoid the great moral crisis of being afraid to be honest. Let me quote to you for a moment from Thomas Merton. One of the moral diseases we communicate to one another in society comes from huddling together in the pale light of an insufficient answer to a question that we are afraid to ask. There is a laziness that pretends to dignify itself by the name of despair and teaches us to ignore both the question and the answer. And there is the despair which dresses itself up as science or philosophy and amuses itself with clever answers to clever questions, none of which have anything to do with the problems of life. One of the problems that we as Pentecostals and Charismatics face is that we often are answering questions that people are not asking or we're putting sticking plasters on deep wounds. What is our theology of despair? 
What is our theology of death? What is our theology of sorrow and loss and heartbreak and pain? We need one. Back in 2017, when I addressed the Leadership Summit in Harrogate, I pleaded with us as a movement to be on the front foot, to be a Pentecostal movement that was thinking about Pentecostalism for the 21st century, that could answer the deep questions of pain and sorrow and heartbreak and loss and sadness and despair. I said then that we needed it desperately. Well, in 2020, we need it more desperately than we have ever needed it. We as Pentecostals, as people of the Spirit, believe that God's Spirit is present with us in every situation and that he takes us through sadness, through grief, through despair and out the other side into life and hope. Please, can we develop a a reasoning, a rationale, a theological answer that helps people address the deep issues of sorrow with more than we'll pray and God will heal you. There is a sorrow and a sadness and a despair that surrounds us and that is invading our culture and now invading our world. And this is not a time for us to have a triumphalistic theology, but instead to have a theology of presence, a theology of meaning that makes sense of loss and sadness and sorrow. And if we can do that, then we can speak into our culture, into our generation in a way that is so profound, so deep, so meaningful and so life-giving that even in the ashes of loss and sadness, something will emerge. But we the generation upon whom God has um, given the responsibility of responding to this crisis must work this out. Helping people to have a theology of death that is thoroughly Pentecostal, a theology of sorrow that makes sense of it and redeems it, is something that we can do. And our churches could be like beacons of hope if we allow God to speak to us and we respond to him. If I'm to address death and loss honestly, for myself or with others, I must find a way of facing it as an enemy, being honest about how it makes me feel and finding a deeper, better, clearer biblical answer than, well, it will never happen to me or anyone that I love. That might feel harsh, but actually this is the path that leads to hope and to being able to address mourning and grief honestly. Because Christian faith believes that alongside the honest pain and heartbreak of death, we can and do have hope. That's why we can face death hopefully. Once I'm able to be honest about death, sorrow and loss, I'm better placed to find hope in the face of it. When I name death as a squatter rather than as a friend, I am able to wrestle with it and fight its negative impact on me on those I love and on those that I lead. When I understand that my sorrow may try to consume me and make me feel like the world should stop, but that the world doesn't actually stop, then I am able to plot a pathway through my daily choices and change my posture so that I can face death and loss defiantly and hopefully. When I understand that sorrow is a jumbled journey, not a linear one, it helps me realise that I am not going mad when everything seems to go backwards one day and forwards the next. When I root myself in understanding grief as seasonal, I'm able to notice the positive and the negative impacts of sorrow and loss in my life and adjust my actions and my timetable and my emotions accordingly. By naming my feelings, by being honest about them, I can then enter into them more fully and I can set them aside when I need to. When I learn to live with life written in both the major and the minor keys, I'm able to hear the deeper music of hope in my soul. Nowhere, nowhere other than in Christ's own resurrection is this more powerfully evident than in the story of the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead, recording in John chapter 11. Jesus allows his friend to die and as a result is confronted by the deep pain and the heartbreak of Lazarus' sister. Also Jesus' friends, Mary and Martha, his probing exchange with them around the nature and the, of life and death should be read slowly, meditatively and humbly with our ears open to the hope of God's promise that death is not the end. When my brother died unexpectedly in 2016, it was this story that carried me through, particularly the promise of Jesus to Martha, your brother will rise again. Yet, Jesus let Lazarus die. 
Jesus did not tell Mary and Martha not to grieve. He didn't dismiss their heartbreak. He didn't assure them that everything would be fine in an hour. Instead, Jesus himself went to the tomb of his friend and he wept. He entered into the grief and the sorrow and the loss as part of the journey to resurrection. He redeemed sorrow as he resurrected Lazarus. Think with me about that for a moment. In this encounter, there are two exchanges between Jesus and uh, the sisters, one with Martha first and then with Mary. Martha meets Jesus and says to him, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. We all know that that is the question of absence. Jesus responds to that question with the words, your brother will live again. Martha then responds with a theological answer. I know that we will all rise on the last day. Jesus asked, answers her intellectual question, her intellectual struggle with death with an intellectual theological answer. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies and he who believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? He answers her where she is. He gives her a theological response to the question of death and it is clear I am stronger than death. This is not the end, but it is not an avoidable part of your life. But when Mary comes, she asks almost exactly the same question. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus doesn't answer with a theological answer. He simply weeps with Mary. One of the things that you and I as pastors must do, one of the things that we as elders, as church leaders, as Christians must do, is learn to see where people are in their grief and to sit with them to let them shape the conversation and for us to be responsive initiators of God's gracious truth into those situations. Job's friends got a lot wrong, but when they heard of Job's grief and sorrow, we are told that they went and they sat with him in silence for a week. We are too quick to give people answers to their sorrow and pain and not quick enough to simply sit with them and to be present. But Jesus does redeem sorrow and grief in the story of the resurrection of Lazarus. Your brother will rise again. This is the hopefulness that is the heartbeat of Christian faith. Not that we avoid death, but rather that death does not have the last word. It is swallowed up in the words of Paul. We are still on this side of the experience of death, but we will not remain on this side. Christ by resurrecting Lazarus, shows us that we will be resurrected. The, foundation rea the foundational reality of the New Testament is not that we avoid death, but rather that we pass through death and into life. Death is not the end. Death does not have the last word. Instead of promising people that they will be fine in this season and quoting Bible verses out of context and lulling them into a false sense of security, the COVID-19 infection that is killing people should remind me, should remind us, that we believe in life more than we believe in death. Our security and our hope and our peace and our strength and our ultimate satisfaction and fulfillment is not rooted in whether we are healthy or sick, whether we are rich or poor, whether we are free from COVID-19 or infected. Our hope and our security and our peace are rooted in the promise that Christ has overcome death. He is the way, the truth and the life and nothing, nothing, not even a pandemic can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. We are not defined by our circumstances. We are refined by them. When we realise that, we at last can come to a place where we can face death helpfully. Our assumptions are exposed by death. Our broken theology is revealed. Our penchant to cling to circumstances more than Christ is shown. This may feel unhelpful to you, but in the end, it is extremely helpful. The idols that we build our lives upon are dethroned as we face death honestly. So much of our Christianity so much of our Pentecostalism has become focused on the here and the now. What God does for me now, what God gives me now. In the overused phrase of the last decades, we have developed an overrealized eschatology. Our already is far more important to us than our not yet far too often. 
Whilst we have run from the old idea that we can be too heavenly minded to be of any earthly use, I think perhaps we have run too far. Many of us are now too earthly minded to be of any heavenly use. Facing death, hopefully, even in the midst of a pandemic, means realising again that we have the hope of heaven, the promise of life after life after death. Yes, I said that, life after life after death. I use the phrase intentionally. And that even death cannot separate us from God. Of course, all of this leaves us realising that there is much that needs to be thought about in our faith, our view of the world and of how we live. It forces us to a position of humility where we acknowledge our frailty and our weakness and our fears and that perhaps we need to be honest about the fact that our faith may not be as strong as we want others to think. Letting go of those we love is extremely painful. I don't think we ever fully let go of them, do we? Should we? We hold their memories and their love in our hearts like droplets of grace. They scent our souls. Their memories linger as we look at an old photograph, as we approach an anniversary, or we simply recollect moments shared. Their impact on us lingers. We feel their loss acutely, and if we could, many of us would want another moment with those that we have lost. But none of this is weakness. None of this is nostalgia. None of it's wrong. It's just honest. I will continue to do my best to help my family and those around me to think through these things and to think them through myself. I have been changed by grief and I have been changed for the better. My mourning has meant something. My heartbreak has opened my soul to more of God's grace. My suffering has reordered me. It has changed me forever. If we let him, this is what God does with sorrow and heartbreak and loss. I have come to see God more clearly and love him more closely whilst understanding him less than I ever have. He has taken the torn fragments of my soul and held them tenderly in his hands. Grief, sorrow and loss have helped me to put him back at the centre of my life and they have allowed me to leave my broken heart in his hands. This is good grief and I am grateful to God for it. So how do we respond to this? As Pentecostals, I think we have to work out a theology that that redeems the very idea of what grief and death is. I am delighted at all of the online streaming that is serving God's people. I'm delighted that, that the numbers attending church have gone through the roof. I'm concerned, however, that we are not mentioning or we are perhaps unable to intellectually or theologically engage with the theology of grief and despair that can reach beyond the church and give those that are not yet Christians hope. This is the moment for us to remember what um, C.S. Lewis said in The Weight of Glory in his sermon in 1941. In a moment of great, great despair and sorrow and loss in our society and in our culture, we rise our heads and say, we believe in life after death. We believe that the gnawing question in the soul of every human being, what happens when I die, has a fundamental answer in Jesus Christ. And we as Pentecostals believe in a spiritual, spirit-enabled answer to that question. When Jesus was confronted in Luke chapter 13 with the uh, tragedy at the Temple Mount in which people died and the tower collapsing at the Pool of Siloam, he made it clear that these were not things sent to punish or to chastise or to reprimand people, but instead these moments, which he doesn't give an explanation for, are moments in which we ask a question about our eternity, about our life, about our future. Many Christians seem to be talking about this being a season in which God is judging us, that God is um, sending a plague upon us, and they're pointing to scriptures about the last times. That may or may not be true. I reserve judgment on it. But it strikes me that when God poured out the plagues on Egypt in Exodus. He made it clear that he was doing it before it, during it and after it. There is no such clarity about this issue. Instead, what we see is that sorrow and heartbreak are affecting the world. I have questions about how you understand the sovereignty of God that we could perhaps explore over a coffee or via Zoom. 
But I want to have a conversation about the fact that um, we may be asking the wrong questions or answering the wrong questions. Steve Jobs, when he founded Apple, said that he knew what people wanted. He just had to help them realise that it was what they wanted. Well, the deep yearning in the human soul is to know what happens when we die. What happens? Does it end? Is there life beyond this? We as Christians, we as Pentecostal Christians, believe that the Spirit leads us into life and out of death. We need to help people answer questions about sorrow and pain and struggle. And there are stories like the story of Job. There are passages like John chapter 11 and 1 Corinthians 15 that can help us develop a clear theology of death, which is not a theology of despair, a theology of hopefulness that I would describe it as, a theology of purpose and meaning and significance in life. You see, I think we as Pentecostal people, we as women and men who believe in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our churches, need to think about what it means to have a theology of hopefulness, a theology of wholeness and a theology of healing. Do I believe that God can heal? Yes. Do I pray for the sick? Absolutely. But do I believe that death is something that we must always run away from? No. The Bible teaches very clearly that death is not the end. So we have a theology of healing that believes that even after death there is healing. That the ultimate resting place and victory of the people of God is our eternity with Christ, with God and reigning and ruling on the earth. So we can approach death and sorrow and pain and despair hopefully and wholly. Instead of running away from them, what would it mean for us as Pentecostal theologians and pastors, for us as women and men who lead into local communities and think these things through, to develop a response to our culture that roots the work of the Spirit in life and points to death as evidence that there is life. I am tempted to also remind you of just a couple of other things. There's a public place for our theology at the moment. I've described a pastoral one to sit with people, to walk with them, to listen with them, to weep with them, to help them understand that this isn't the end. But there is a public place for us to take. I have been mystified and deeply, deeply concerned at the way in which the figures have been collected, not only in the United Kingdom, but around the world. What does it mean to ignore the death numbers of those in care homes until it's absolutely vital to put them in? What does it mean when ethics committees are working out who gets a ventilator and who doesn't and they decide that people with disabilities or people that have long-term conditions can be left to die? What does it mean when we say, well, the vulnerable will die? The very posture of our society is a posture that has devalued some life and valued other life. Do we not have something to say to that as Pentecostals? I thank God for the Ministry of Care and for Lyndon Barring and for all that we have as a movement in that rich heritage. We believe in life before death. We believe in life in the womb. We believe in life after the grave. And we believe that the Spirit breathes life into all people and that every human being is made in the image of God. This season for us is a season when we can, as believers, empowered by God's Spirit, say we see the Spirit of God, the life and breath of God in every human being. And we want to talk about a society that seems to degrade or devalue or to judge or to um, position people or prioritise them according to what we think is valid. When their human life is what gives them validity, validity and dignity and worth and value. I think we have something to say about that in our local communities, into our families, into our societies, into our local churches, into our hospitals, into our health service, into our care service. And what does it mean at this moment when we seem to be valuing a 100-year-old who can raise £30 million? And so we should, Colonel Tom Moore, and thank God for all that he has achieved. And yet at the same time, hold a view of life which seems to treat others at his age as less valuable. There are moments for us to engage in profound and important discussions about life and value and purpose and meaning in this season. I am delighted that the Elam Church in Ireland has put together a five-week series across May and Sunday nights at 7.30 called Words of Hope, addressing this very thing. On the 3rd of May, I addressed the question, does COVID-19 have the last word? Pastor Edwin Michael, Charlotte Curran, Darren McClatchy, John McAvoy, leaders in Elam and one ex-leader in Elam, are sharing words that are evangelistic and missional and purposeful 
and trying to answer the deeper questions of our society and of our culture and challenge some of the assumptions. That's a good thing for us to do in this season. Grief can open people to the possibility of better answers, of deeper, deeper solutions to the challenges and the uncertainties that they face. And if we can take it, this could give us a moment to be um, apologetic in a good sense and purposeful into our culture. I think we as theologians and as pastors need to develop a deeper and stronger understanding of the spirit and prescience of the spirit and presence and of the spirit and promise. As a Pentecostal theologian, as a practical theologian and as a public theologian, I think the spirit of God has gone ahead of us that he is prescient, that he knows what would happen in this situation and that his life is present in the midst of all of the sorrow and the uncertainty. So we face it humbly and honestly. We face it searching for answers, but we face it believing that the spirit is present, that he has something to say into our culture and into our world. And perhaps this is a time for us to rediscover the more profound and powerful understanding of presence The presence of God is not somewhere else. The presence of God is here. He is in the room when every person loses a loved one. His presence is not removed by death. It is not broken by sorrow and despair. God doesn't leave the room when somebody dies. He didn't close the door when the COVID-19 epidemic broke out. He isn't some kind of deus that has withdrawn from our world and watches with his arms folded as the COVID-19 pandemic sweeps across the world. Surely we as Pentecostals have a theology of presence that in the midst of despair, there is life and hope. In the midst of death, there is life. In the midst of sadness, there is purpose. And we can begin to unpack what this means, that God is with you, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're American or British, black or white, man or woman. If you are in Christ, then Christ is in you and there is hope and life and the presence of God is in the world and we join him as he seeks to transform it. This theology, this Pentecostalism is more prescient and more present than always depending on the the exponential or the sudden or the unexpected. We are not simply people who are looking for a miracle. We are people who believe that the presence of God in our lives is itself miraculous and that through heartbreak and pain, joy and sadness, hope and despair, God is present. Surely that is what it means for us to be a Pentecostal witness in the world, believing in healing, praying for the sick, believing in resurrection, believing in miracles, believing in the gifts of the Spirit. All of those, yes and amen and yes and amen and yes and amen. But developing a deeper theology that says when those miracles are absent, God is still present. When the intervention isn't what we have asked for, God is still at work. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus We need a Pentecostalism that grapples with sorrow, grapples with suffering, grapples with fear and speaks into the 21st century. And if we can do that, then as a movement and as churches, we have the deepest answer to the deepest questions that our society might be facing. And a spirit-enabled theology of presence leads to a spirit-enabled theology of promise. This is not the end of the story. To be Pentecostal is to believe that the Spirit of God lives with us, that he has empowered us for service and that this same Spirit has gone ahead of us and is drawing us into the purposes and plans of God in the world. In the words of 1 Peter, this Spirit work in us, this powerful hope of resurrection and new birth and life draws us and propels us. It is both centripetal and centrifugal. When we know this hope in our hearts through the new birth, Secured for us by the resurrection, according to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Two things happen. The first is we are drawn into the promises of God. There is a centripetal force about the Spirit's presence in our lives. We are drawn into him. We are drawn into worship, into praise, into adoration, into Christian community. But there is also a centrifugal force of the Spirit. He casts us out. He spins us around and pushes us into the world that the world might know that this hope that we hold is real and true and eternal and nothing can shake it. It is my greatest privilege to be a Christian and one of the greatest privileges of my life is to be a servant of God through the Elam movement. I love it and I am grateful to God for it. 
And I plead with us to develop a Pentecostal theology that is fit for the 21st century, that holds on to the radicalism of our founders, that believes in the miraculous and the instantaneous and the sudden intervention of God, but also makes sense of the world. A public Pentecostal theology for the 21st century that answers grief with hope, that answers despair with uh, faith, that answers loss with being found, that answers isolation with companionship and that breathes life into our situations, our cultures and our countries and around the world. May we let the breath of the Spirit through us proclaim hope, life and grace to those around us. Let's pray. Lord, today I want to ask you for every pastor, every fellow leader, every sister and brother joining with me as we think about how we respond to this pandemic. I pray for those that have lost family and loved ones. Comfort them, Lord. Give them grace and hope and courage. But I pray that you would give us as a movement, a theology that faces death defiantly, that speaks of eternal life, that is rooted in hope but that doesn't pretend, that isn't triumphalistic, that doesn't quote verses out of context. Lord, help us to be a people of the presence of God, recognising your presence with us always. And may our words, our actions and our attitudes bring hope for those who need us just to sit with them in silence as they grieve. Lord, give us the grace and the courage to do that. But help us to be pastoring people into life, into hope, and help us to give answers that are rooted in Scripture. I pray, Father, that you would remind us that your son didn't answer suffering. He entered it through the cross and that he weeps with those who weep, that he is broken with those who are broken. And I pray for my colleagues like me who are working hard to try and make this all into some kind of sense in a local context. Those of us that are burying people, that are comforting people that have lost loved ones, that have lost friends ourselves. We pray for the families in our movement of leaders that have died. Lord, would you give them grace and strength for those who haven't been able to attend funerals? And I ask in Jesus' name that we would have a pastoral Pentecostal theology that brings the Spirit's presence into sharp focus in the midst of darkness and despair. I pray that we would have a public theology that would be a theology that is hopeful, helpful and whole. And I pray that our lives, our movement, our leadership, our vision and our strategy would develop a Pentecostal theology for the 21st century that can speak into the deepest, darkest moments of our life. We need you. We need your breath and your grace and your strength. And we thank you that you are ready to give it. Father, we come to you with honest, humble hearts. We cannot understand all of this, but we know that you are good and your love endures forever. So we bring our honesty to you, our vulnerability, And we pray, Lord, that you will strengthen our faith and open our eyes and use us as a witness to the broken, the hurting and the confused. We thank you that we have a hopeful theology. We have a hopeful conviction. This is not the end. You are the God that makes all things new. And we don't wait for that as a panacea. As we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, as that darkness rests on our eyelids, Lord, remind us that you are present Give us hope and courage and may we pastor, lead, preach, teach, write and plan as people who believe in the presence of God in the midst of all things. We ask it in Jesus' name.